Welcome to the Diversity and Inclusion On Air podcast. This podcast is a program of the Association of American Veterinary Medical College's Diversity Matters Initiative. This show explores various issues related to diversity and inclusion in the veterinary profession and provides AAVMC uh, the opportunity to offer ongoing diversity programming to our member institutions as well as all veterinary professionals. My name is Lisa Greenhill and I'm the Senior Director for Institutional Research and Diversity at the AAVMC. So on today's episode of the uh, podcast, I am delighted to welcome the president of the Lesbian Gay Veterinary Medical Association, Dr. Melinda Merck. So uh, she and I are going to chat a bit about the history of the organization, some of the things that um, they've got going on now and what the future looks like. So uh, welcome, Melinda. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us. So um, we always start with uh, a bit of an introduction. So I always invite my guests to introduce themselves and tell a little bit about their background and kind of how did you get to this moment? <laughs> uh, that's a, um, I'll try to keep that short. I'm not sure how I got here, but the uh, my background is I was a, in feline practice in Atlanta uh, for almost 18 years and then started working in the uh, developing veterinary forensics and that led to me becoming more involved with the North American veterinary community and speaking there and eventually on their board um, and when I was president of that board I came out as their first uh, uh, lesbian uh, president uh, what was that 2016 uh, 2017 yeah. and that um, through, I guess, my work with NAVC, became aware of LGVMA and got uh, involved with them in their strategic planning. And somehow I ended up as president last year. <laughs> <laughs> so I went from one presidency to another. Yeah. Oh, so that's very cool. in, in a nutshell, I think. So we, you know, we actually have a lot of pre-veterinary students who um, listen to the show. Could you talk a little bit about uh, veterinary for and feline forensics? So that's a career path we haven't really heard and talked a lot about. So oh, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I think being in feline practice, it it um, it, it turns out that cats are um, more likely to die from animal abuse and I worked with shelters and um, I guess I've, I've always done advocacy work but and that's how I started seeing animal cruelty and became um, a part of a, a legal group to provide education to prosecutors and uh, law enforcement on how to do that and in order to provide education, I had to learn. So I worked with medical examiners and what that is is um, what I do is apply veterinary knowledge in, in combining that with what we know about human forensics and how that can be applied to cases involving animals, which typically it's it's animal cruelty investigations, but it can be wildlife. Uh, there's a huge, beautiful, uh, very interesting uh, wildlife forensic center that's a federal lab up in um, Ashland, Oregon. So they've been doing that for a while because of our federal laws. Um, but this is new on the companion animal and other animal side because of the laws changing and the recognition of animal abuse and other types of crimes. So that's that's what started that road, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. I read Nancy Drew novels, so I always <laughs> I wanted to be Quincy of animals, I guess. So um, for those that are old enough to know who Quincy was. <laughs> So yeah, that's what it is. It's, it's Google a new that. field. Yeah, Google that. And we're seeing it starting to be included in some of the schools like um, Purdue and um, even Cornell and uh, other shelter medicine courses at the universities. They'll have some kind of lectures on the topic, but they have full courses on it at Purdue and University of Florida and University of Georgia. And uh, Texas A&M has a whole program. So yeah, we're starting to see it grow because it's an important part of veterinary medicine because you will see abuse. So you got to know what to do. Sure. I mean, I think that, um, you know, there's so many shows on um, on TV now, too, that really kind of spotlight this particular um, topic area, of course, the the veterinarian is not kind of the featured position in those um, right. in the in the TV um, you know kind of 
um, shrunk down stories for um, bite size for TV, but it, this is a really exciting thing. So, um, so that'll be another show. Okay. <laughs> you okay. Really fascinating. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because you know one of the things it, it is because we also have this link with domestic violence mm -hmm. and animal abuse, and veterinarians are sometimes at first touch point uh, for the whole family being at risk. Yeah. Sure. 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 All right, so we're gonna track back to LGVMA. So, um, so all of this stuff happened, and then here you are, president, just a yes. couple of years later. <laughs> how awesome is that? So, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, LGVMA, kind of how it came to be? What's the history around the organization? It started in 1977. Originally, it was called the Association for Gay Veterinarians, and it was all men. And they were trying to create a group for gay veterinarians and say pretty much, hey, we're here. Uh, they placed an ad in the Advocate and um, said they were having a network networking meeting at AVMA, which um, prompted some irate responses from the AVMA, some of the AVMA members, I guess, um, calling it a degenerate ad. So that's where we were in 1977, right? And then the AIDS crisis hit and um, then uh, that took, you know, uh, took a lot of people yeah. out, you know? And uh, so the organization died out in 1988. Um, then what they did is they, they started working with other groups that uh, were working with people with AIDS and their pets, like uh, uh, Pets Are Wonderful Support, and reformed as I'm Glad, an international membership of gay and lesbian animal doctors. So they did that for a few years. Um, and then eventually they became um, LGVMA, which includes vets and the veterinary technicians and the entire veterinary community. So that's how it kind of went back then. All yeah. right. So, so what's the organization's mission today? So I know that you all have done some strategic planning and, and all of that. And, and certainly, you know, from, from what you just shared, it sounds like a lot of it was just kind of building some community in what seemed to be my potentially a really isolating time. So, so what's the mission? That, that's true. It, it is about building community. And the mission is to uh, foster acceptance and inclusivity for people of all sexual orientations and gender identities within the veterinary medical profession. And that's our focus. Um, whatever that, that's very fluid on what that looks like and responding to what the issues are as they arise, mm -hmm. as they evolve. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, so what kinds of things has LGVMA really been, wh what have you guys been doing, um, um, guys, gals, and all non-binary and trans, and <laughs> what has everybody <laughs> been doing in oh. LGVMA over the years? We've been doing a lot of things, in, in, especially in recent years, you know, um, first it started as a networking uh, to try to find each other and mm -hmm. do some advocacy when it came up and then over time we started uh, really focusing on students uh, through scholarship and leadership grants and um, developing um, guiding the guidelines or helping other professions or other organizations within our profession on non-discrimination policies and wellness issues and then um, just keeps growing in the geez in the recent years um, it, it's been um, all across the board we we did as you mentioned this big strategic planning um, in uh, at AVMA last summer in 2017 and what came out of that is that we would have um, a new name, we're rebranding, and we're gonna change our tax status to from a 501c6 to a 501c3. Mm. So that was a, that strategic plan, um, we are, we had high hopes for, you know, the implementation uh, of that, but uh, for as far as the timing of it, but it, it's, it's really coming along. And we have tremendous engagement with not only our board, but, um, uh, other members in the we're trying to involve these members okay that that's been our big push uh, we do booths we try to 
spread the word. And that's how I learned about them. I didn't know anything about them. And they had a booth at uh, the uh, North American Veterinary Community's annual conference. Um, and we tried to have a booth at the AVMA's, uh, the the student AVMA, the SAVMA uh, meeting, the VMAE, the AAVM at your, your conference in sure. Iverson Bell. Um, so we that's where we're trying to increase our visibility um, because still a lot of people don't know who we are and what we do, right? Okay. And some of that comes from partnerships. Uh, you know, we partner with Vivaldi um, in doing joint workshops and um, other initiatives and it, whether it's social media or whatever something, something comes, comes up, I think we've been really good about uh, working together yeah. on that. So I think those are our are, are big ones. We the, the big thing I guess we did a few years ago was a project we did with, with you at AAVMC and AVMA in Auburn in this uh, LGBT wellness survey mm. that Dr. Tracy Whitty did. And we yeah. sent Dr. Chaddick from Michigan State uh, to coordinate and work with her. And they're presenting all of that uh, this year at AVMA. Okay. So that was very insightful, that information that came from that survey. Sure, sure. So yeah, we just uh, at AVMC, we just um, completed our 2018 annual conference and LGVMA was certainly represented there with a booth um, and lots of, of traffic. So um, and just personally, I've um, just enjoyed working with the group so much over the years. And, and uh, last year I was on the Wolvaldi board and participated in a, a jointly um, sponsored panel on diversity and parenting. And there were um, a lot of us there kind of talking about just um, different ways that we've come to um, become, you know, become parents rather than um, biology. And so um, it was a really a great and, and meaningful panel um, where we have all of the same issues as biological parents, but some other stuff too. So, right? so. Yeah, I was there then and you did a Facebook live um, yeah, uh, we for that event. And, and it was, it was, um, you know, I did, I heard you speak, I heard the whole panel and it was very, it, it was highly attended, number yeah. one. Um, and, and the issues, as you said, that you, that were brought up were things I wasn't even aware of, you yeah. know, I, I, I'm a pet parent, not a human parent. Um, <laughs> but um, that I, I think more panels like that in discussing those issues is what we need. We had an interesting, uh, we did our first town hall, um, LGB, L LGBMA and um, at, at VMX. And we're looking hopefully to have another one uh, at AVMA and just try to do those everywhere. But it was very enlightening. Um, it was an intimate group. There was about 40 people there. Um, but to talk about their stories mm -hmm. um, and talk about the issues. And we had everything from students, technicians to veterinarians. And um, what was interesting from that was it, and it helps us identify issues. What's interesting is like there was a woman, she's like, I'm opening up a practice. How do I advertise or interview for uh, the appropriate, you know, em uh, employees, yeah. no matter what the position is? Um, there was uh, another one, her partner was a technician and she's a veterinarian and they want to move together. So what do they, how do they, how do they find jobs? How do they find the community that that will accept them um and then <clears throat> so those those we're going to continue that town hall uh experience uh to to provide voice to provide mm -hmm. support and to identify these issues and what we can do for the our, our community yeah Oh, great, great. Um, and uh, I'm going to take a moment for a shameless promotion of diversity <laughs> and inclusion on air. <laughs> um, we did a show a couple of years ago um, during the height of the um, bathroom bill, you know, debate, shenanigans, all of those kinds of things. And, and one of the big issues that um, one of the questions that actually prompted me to do that show had to do with um, a fourth year student who had an externship in North Carolina um, after the bill was passed and signed and was really, really concerned about what their experience was going to be like. Um, and so, you know, we did a show 
um, really kind of talking about not only kind of safe spaces, but um, what the law meant, where the law applied, who was actually following it. Um, and it didn't just have to do, and it, you know, the impact certainly, <clears throat> excuse me, for, for fourth year students who are doing um, their clinical rotations, um, this is a kind of very meaningful thing where every two, four or six weeks, you're kind of touching down potentially somewhere else and having to make some really tough life decisions about, you know, disclosures that are innocuous as what did you do this weekend <laughs> and how did you spend your time or who did you spend, who did you hang out with? Um, but this is also really important for individuals who are looking for jobs in states that have, um, you know, discriminatory um, bills or legislations or laws or don't offer specific protections for individuals with different gender identities um, or sexual orientations. So um, we'll be posting um, when this show uh, releases, we'll certainly also post links to that show as well, especially during during a period of time when folks are are looking. <laughs> that's that's excellent. You know, and, and that came up as an issue. Um, I brought that up as an issue when you were talking about what do you talk about what you did for the weekend, right? Yeah. Is that as as a veterinarian that, that was in private practice, I, I want to engage with my clients. I want to right. connect with them. I want to be their family doctor. Um, but I there's a barrier there that I can't um, or didn't always feel comfortable discussing my anything personal. Right. Um, it was very um, filtered, yes. you know, on what I would talk about, um, and that that hurts our profession, right? That hurts our ability to because even to engage with the clients because even if you live in a, a city like I do in Austin, Texas, it's very accepting. Um, in as an overall label that doesn't necessarily mean that in each individual that comes in your room is right in your right. exam room right. um so that that's an issue we had a as part of our advocacy we had the aafp right after that law was passed was having their annual conference or one of their conferences mm -hmm. in north carolina and reached out to us for guidance on how to handle you know there's for those who don't know about planning conferences you can you can't just cancel without getting a bunch of penalties. So how could they navigate that and still, you know, come out on top, mm -hmm. you know, as far as um, not um, supporting that law, of course, and and then what, what could they do to uh, support the transgender community as well? So that's one of the things we'll do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We learned a lot from that experience. Yeah. Wow. Well, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So what impact do you think that LGVMA has had for, um, you know, the profession and specifically for um, veterinarians who identify as LGBT or um, any of the other um, identities that kind of falls within that particular acronym we know, which isn't, um, you know, those letters aren't as inclusive as we'd like them to be. I know, it's the, the whole alphabet soup there right. uh, if, uh, for doing that. I how we've impacted them is by creating this community and then adv advocacy on 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 the their behalf there was a letter writing campaign that we did uh, with a to avma uh to um uh, ask them to have this non-discrimination policy uh, and to include gender identity and expression which they did so it was very effective um we create this networking community for them. We're, we've started this, especially in response to the town hall, a job posting mm -hmm. site so that people can post on there, right? We're looking for you. Um, or we want somebody um, uh, from your community or we're accepting whatever um, will make them feel safe in that area. Um, this, of course, the wellness survey and, and getting that information. And that's been really impactful. We presented that, uh, Dr. Chaddick did to the students at Broad Spectrum mm -hmm. um, and also at the SAVMA symposium uh, to make them aware of the issues. Cause he's got some demographics as well mm -hmm. of where they can uh, look at finally landing. Uh, and then we, nurture relationships uh, across the different ponds, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. with the British and the Australian LGBT associations. Um, so I think making it 
more of an international networking type of community. Uh, so I think it's been positive. One of the things in response, not only to the town hall, but I think just in generally the issues and came out of our strategic plan is we're developing a safe space certification for hospitals. Okay. So um, we're in the early planning stages and developing partnerships, um, but so that it doesn't just include the LG BT plus community mm -hmm. issues, but also things about uh, going along with the Me Too movement, sexual harassment, mm -hmm. and to include domestic violence as a um, awareness. And so that people are trained in those, uh, in the language and resources and what to do. And I think that that's going to have a huge impact on the veterinary community, period, not just LGBT. Right? Sure. Sure. Yeah, I think it's so much of what we're seeing kind of going on just in, in the broader kind of social arena <laughs> shows us there's a lot of work to do with a lot of different communities. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 It'll be, yeah. Um, it, you think it, it, any kind of advocacy work or any, you know, even the work that I do, you can feel like you've made these giant strides and then you, it takes just nothing to feel like you've stepped back. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's very scary. We did a... Um, we did a round, and we're continue to do these roundtable discussions at mm -hmm. SAVMA, the students' uh, uh, symposium with AVMA, and that is very enlightening. We do these roundtables, and then they can move, right? You know, it's like the dating yeah. game, right? <laughs> and they can spend time one on one with leaders, not only uh, from LGVMA but AVMA, and it's very impactful to hear their stories, yeah. um, in their concerns and. And it, for me, it was very inspiring because there were hundreds of students mm -hmm. at this diversity roundtable discussion. And, and um, so I, I think that that's, um, we're going to definitely continue to do that. Great. Yeah. Great. So um, speaking of students, how are you engaging students? So certainly having a presence, um, um, kind of not just exhibiting, but participating and programming at, at SAFMA, but certainly we know um, that LGVMA has, has a long kind of history with um, the student organization, broad spectrum, um, at some schools it's full spectrum, at some <laughs> schools they have, um, you know, it kind of, there's numerous permutations of this organization, this yeah. student organization where they also, um, you know, exist or and or coexist as or alongside um, the group voice. So um, what's LGVMA doing with students these days? We we have um, a liaison from Broad Spectrum that works with our board. Um, we do student leadership grants um, and we get a lot of um, especially this past uh, year or so, we've had a lot of um, uh, corporate sponsorship. A many a, a good chunk of that is directed towards the student efforts. We um, we support the poster program that's at the AAVMC um, and sending the students there. Uh, we have on our board a liaison for the students and Broad Spectrum. Though Broad Spectrum, you know, we'll see what happens. They, they joke, um, I don't know that they joke, but their name gets confused. <laughs> they said they can send out something about broad spectrum and people will send it to clinical pathology or infectious disease thing. It's about broad spectrum antibiotics. So they're struggling with their name, I think, uh, <laughs> at least internally at the schools. Um, and we include them. We not only sent, we've sent students to speak and we include them on panel discussions. I, I think that's really important to empower them uh, to uh, to be advocates and to discuss their issues. I, I, there's mm -hmm. so many issues that I'd never even considered after sitting down with them in the roundtable discussions. Um, sadly, some of them, like the day after the presidential election, um, their their vehicles were targeted because it had bumper stickers identifying them. Um, it, it was very very interesting and and we want to work with the vet schools as well right the colleges uh to um increase their uh their the way that they portray themselves to the students that was another thing that came out there was a student 
in one state that has a vet school that didn't go there went out of state because he didn't feel like he was going to be accepted mm -hmm. um and so I, I that's those are things mm -hmm. that really shouldn't be happening in this day and age you right. know so what are we doing how do we do that we send Michael uh, Chaddock again from Michigan State to do talks at the schools to mm -hmm. make them aware of the survey. Um, and, um, and and then the big one, of course, is we do social events for the students, hey. which they love. <laughs> Hardly have ever met a vet student that didn't love food. Then a social <laughs> event. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we did get a question. Um, my colleague, who is a um, former officer for LGBMA, Tony Wynn, in our office, our director of admissions and recruitment. And um, Tony works a lot with pre veterinary students who are getting ready to go into the application process and those types of things. And um, one of his big questions, and I want to set this up so that we can see a little bit of um, our data, we collect data on. Um, applicants at AAVMC. And this year is the first year that we have um, have included some of that data in our public data set, which is available on aavmc.org um, under public data. Um, and so this year we included um, um, two tables in particular, expressed gender identity for applicants um, for the class of 2022. Um, and, and you'll see that data on screen. Um, overwhelmingly, we still um, have uh, folks identifying um, 85 over 85% female, um, fewer than 15% male. But we also included a gender not listed here, and um, I've just lost my slide here, um, gender not listed here, as well as um, uh, individuals who identify on the trans um, gender spectrum. So I think we have it back on screen now. Um, these last two, a gender not listed here and um, on uh, the transgender spectrum make up about 0.3%. Now, the thing with the, on the transgender spectrum, we recognize that those individuals will um, potentially self-identify in any of these other categories, which may result in a very low number responding specifically um, yes on this question. And so those individuals will likely be um, identifying male or female or another gender, but we did include that. And then in, um, we also asked applicants um, to self-identify orientation. And um, we, we included um, a lot more than bisexual, gay, lesbian, and an orientation not listed here. But these are um, the data on the screen is reflective of um, the, um, the responses that we um, accumulated in our surveys. And we had about eight 0.3% of individuals identifying as bi, um, gay or lesbian, or, um, or an orientation that isn't listed on um, the chart. So Melinda, one of the things that we were really interested in maybe having you talk about is, um, you know, is there a role for LGVMA in thinking about pre-vet outreach? Uh, I think absolutely. And it, it, it it's, but is it, how do we do that? Yeah. <laughs> you know, how do we do that? I there's um, I've been um, contacted by some pre vet groups, and there's there's multiples, right? Even within Texas here, or uh, in how do you reach them? And I think, of course, with the internet, there's ways to do that. Sure. But I don't know if we can organize and be able to do that. They it, it goes to where they apply, just like the student I had mentioned, yeah. where. where where can they apply? You know, we know that deans that are highly engaged in the diversity uh, and inclusion efforts, the um, with partnering or allies with LGVMA, we know that those deans, you know, you see within the school there in the college, uh, broad spectrum, or there, it's very much obvious on their website or their culture, right? So. Right. 
it really to me that's a call out that we that all the schools need to have a plan and the lgvma definitely can can partner that's a that's an opportunity for partnership and collaboration right what does that look like we certainly have i'm very proud that we have several young uh, veterinarians on our board um, that are still plugged in uh, these their recent experiences and are highly engaged with still um, passionate about uh, the students and their experiences and want to make that better for them yeah. uh, so I think that that's that's um that's an untapped and significant area where we can make a difference it, it, it impacts where they're going to apply yeah it impacts um how they can be authentic mm -hmm. um in their uh in their as they move forward in their education in their career but i think it starts with that application yeah. process you know what are the genders that are listed right yeah. um and maybe it's proactive on their website is this these are the programs that uh you know, this is our diversity and inclusion. We are a safe space, right? Yeah. We're a safe yeah. space certified or, you know, how can they communicate to all of them out there? Because yeah. people have a choice on where they're gonna go to school, but they need to feel comfortable and that they have advocates within, within the college. Yeah. We certainly at AAVMC encourage applicants to, you know, certainly look at the academic program um, and, you know, those requirements and all of those kinds of things. But we also, um, we just hosted a, a career fair with, in which 90% of attendees were um, high school students. And, and it's, um, it's the same thing that I tell, um, you know, high school students as they're thinking about going to undergrad. Um, certainly you want you know, to go to air quote, a good school, right? But we also want you to be able to live your, your best life, your whole life um, mm -hmm. and bring all of yourself. And so, you know, it's really important to, in, um, to look for an institution that has the type of culture and climate that will support you um, being able to do that. And I think it's also really important because, um, in 2012, 2013, we did a study as well, looking specifically at LGBT um, student experience in the DVM program. And um, and it echoed some of the themes that we saw in our, our um, 2011 study on climate. And, and um, our students who self-identify as LGBT typically hear everything. I would almost say that they are some of the best um, <laughs> Um, folks to ask about an institution's climate, right? Because um, there's uh, so much sensitivity in terms of, um, you know, certainly whether or not it's inclusive of um, individuals who identify um, as one of the LGBT identities, but those folks are far more likely to also hear um, um, comments if, you know, if there are sexist, racist, homophobic comments floating around, our LGBT students actually are the most likely to hear those comments, right? Not necessarily directed at them, but there's a greater sensitivity about everything that's going on in the soup at an institution. And so, um, you know, we got a lot of really great, somewhat depressing data <laughs> about, mm. um, you know, what was what a, a, an inclusive environment actually looked like. Um, and so, we'll, I'll drop a link um, to. Um, some of the presentations and some of the data around that um, in the show notes for this show. So. Yeah, I think that's a whole initiative that with a collaboration of partners, we could, um, we could develop even more for them. Yeah. yeah. It's, but it, it's, it's how, I don't know that we can, I, you could it could be a two prong approach, right? Where you reach right. out to any pre vet groups, and then you do it from the college level, right? Right. Going out, right. Right. right? right. So, Melinda, what do you hope to accomplish during your presidency? Huh. And it's a one year, <laughs> two year. It's a two year for life, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> it's a two year plus, according to uh, the past president. Um, <laughs> she said I was on longer than two years. So, um, you know, the the strategic plan is is bold and and needed, and um, we have the energy, and I think the right people and the membership that's that 
are going to bring it forward. The key part of of this is going to be is is our partnerships. We've got these great corporate sponsors um, with BI, Zoetis Hills, VCA, Bamfield, and even Vetfolio, which is that partnership with NAVC and AHA, did a fundraiser at VMX and raised money for us. So um, that that is growing, helping to support what we want to do. So what I want to see is these partnerships solidify that we have with with AAVMC, with um, in AVMA. We have a standing conference call once a month now with AVMA um, to discuss issues, opportunities, um, which I think is fantastic. Wivaldi has been a key partner. So I want to see that grow. That's what I want to see accomplished because through that we can um, not just rise up, but respond to issues, perhaps be even more proactive. Mm -hmm. My main goal now is um, that safe space certification. I believe in that. I think that that will change the world for the entire veterinary community, for not only those hospitals, Mm -hmm. you know, um, because there's people within those hospitals that are struggling, uh, perhaps even within that community, uh, within that hospital, that culture, uh, microaggressions, like you said, hearing things and um, just not being able to be authentic. And and I think that we'll see a healthier, healthier practices it will empower students and you know veterinarians and vet techs to be able to find a place with to to create their own home um so that's that's my big passion right now is i want to see that uh we've got the right people uh to do this so exciting i'm really i'm excited um for the organization and certainly looking forward to um supporting you all at aavmc in any way that we can um so just yeah just let us know we'll do i'll be calling you after this (laughs) (laughs) that's great so um melinda as we get ready to wrap up um if folks are um interested in learning more about lgvma um where do they need to go and who do they need to call who they need to call uh so the the LGVMA has a website, lgvma.org. Uh, we are redoing that uh, because it hasn't been updated, I don't think, in a couple of years. That's part of our strategic plan. Um, we're also, uh, the you may end up getting redirected. We are changing our name. We're rebranding okay. um, because of the limitation of LGVMA and um, acronym, uh, city, alphabet, uh-huh. Soup. Uh, so uh, right now we're looking at, we still have to finalize it, but we're tentatively, it's going to be Pride VMA. Uh, it seems awesome. to be getting the most votes. Um, so that will be the way to contact us. And there's a, a the info where you hit the contact on the website will reach myself and Ken Gorsica, who's our executive secretary and does everything. He's <laughs> amazing. Um, and our secretary. So that is the way to reach us with ideas, thoughts, um, support. I want to get involved. We, like I said, we want to involve our members. Sure. And can allies um, join LGVMA? Absolutely. We have a large number of allies. Yes, absolutely. So you heard it here, folks. <laughs> it's not an exclusive organization. Sometimes we get a little bit of pushback when when we hear um, about um, affiliate organizations um, that these are really not um, exclusionary. It's really that this is what they're going to talk about at this particular group. And if you're down with that, um, you know, go talk about it with them. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So anything else that you want folks to know about LGVMA as we get ready to wrap up? You know, I I think we've covered most of it. I I think um, I'm very excited about this timing for organization and for, you know, the entire veterinary world. Uh, All issues of diversity and our um, have come to the forefront in this, especially in this past year. Um, so it's good discussions to be having. And as you said, we need the allies. The allies help spread the word and support what we do. So thank you so much for allowing me the time to talk about our organization and the future. 
Thank you. Thanks for joining us and uh, happy early Pride Month. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Many of our institutions will be observing um, Pride Month um, in April or May when this particular episode um, drops in your podcast feed. So um, be, share, be sure to share it widely um, and give it a lot of thumbs up on the podcast app of your choice. So, Melinda, thank you so much for taking some time out to join uh, me and chatting about LGVMA and to, to be on Diversity and Inclusion on Air. Thank you, Lisa. All right. Until next time, everyone, um, be sure to check out the uh, Diversity and Inclusion on Air um, channel on YouTube, as well as the Facebook page, uh, Diversity and on Inclusion on Air at AAVMC. We post a lot of um, good information on the Facebook page, so it's a great place to check in and see what's going on, um, on uh, with relation to DNI issues across the profession. So with that, um, we will bring this episode to a close again. Thank you, Dr. Merck, and we will see you all next time. All right, terminated.